This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly. Okay, good morning, everyone. You're very welcome to this morning's um, Infrastructure Committee meeting. We have a quorum. Um, there aren't too many of us to advise of social distancing, but I'll do so anyway. Um, today, we will consider subordinate legislation. We will have a briefing from Waterways Ireland and then a briefing from the Northern Ireland uh, Local Government Association as well. Um, just advise, obviously, that um, due to the majority of members and also witnesses joining the meeting remotely, it would be helpful, as usual, um, for members just to um, indicate using the hand up icon if they wish to ask questions at each agenda item. Um, and also, if members could make sure that their mic um, has been muted just to avoid interference during the evidence um, session. Um, with regards to apologies, I have received an apology from um, David Hildage, the, the Deputy Chair. Um, and I understand that all other members are, are now in. Okay, thank you. So, moving then to item two, Chair's business. Um, and I'll draw your attention to pages five to 16, which is the documents regarding the committee inquiry into decarbonisation of transport. Are members content with the with um, what has been tabled in your pack and with regards to the way forward for our inquiry. Okay, thank you. And the members are also content that, um, that we write to TransLink just regarding the incidents um, which occurred on the, the rail line at Ballerina and um, to pass on our regards obviously to the train driver and to the, the bus driver um, with regards to the metro bus in in North Belfast, if members are content that we do that, we can. I concur with that, Chair. Yeah. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Um, and just another item which has been drawn to my attention, which some members in, in the localities may be aware of, which is in relation to the the contract for um, the resurfacing um, in four areas of Mid Ulster, Oma, Newry, Morning Down, and Derry and Straban. And I understand that there are issues in relation to that contract. So if members are content that we write to the department just to get a, an update with regards to that. Yeah, Chair, it's having a lot, the, uh, lot of issues for, for the Dairy Straban, the council area. Um, we're getting a lot of complaints um, from constituents and rightly so. So it needs to find, a, they need to find a resolution. This needs resolved. Okay. So if members are content that we do that, uh, I'm trying to find out what what the situation is with the contract and also um, what's going to, how that's going to be addressed in the interim period. Okay, thank you. Moving then to draft minutes. So the draft minutes at page 18, and that's for the meeting of the 10th of March. Uh, are members content with those? Okay. And then at table three, we have the draft minutes of the concurrent committee meeting on the 24th of March. If members are content with that also. Okay, thank you. Moving then to matters arising at page 27, and that's from the meeting of the 10th of March, which seems such a long time ago now. Um, do members have any issues arising from that meeting which they would like to follow up on at this stage? No indication. Okay, and then at page 30, we have the outstanding committee requests for information, and you will see um, in your pack that a number of those have been followed up by more than one email um, to departments, which is, um, is far from satisfactory. Sure. Mr. Buchanan? Just, just on that, I'm looking at that, for example, number reference number 117 on page 30. For example, that Department of Health one, what course of action can we take considering we originally communicated on the 10th or the 12th? What is our course of action apart from, to be fair, re emails or communication? We can remind them again, but there's not much else we can do. I suppose if we wanted to, we could it's just that's a long time keep following up. But of Christmas to now, isn't it? Although members will also have experience of even yeah. longer pieces of correspondence yeah. from, from some of the departments, but it, it isn't really very satisfactory when it's coming from the committee. So the members are content that we we email again, but also within that reminder, um, perhaps just make that comment. Mm -hmm. 
Any other comments at this stage? No? Okay, thank you. Moving then to correspondence, and you will see the memo at page 35, and how we propose to address each of those pieces of correspondence. If members do have something which they want to discuss, um, if, they can, if they can indicate. Um, let me just draw your attention to a few of those. At page 61, we have correspondence from the the Chair's Liaison Group, just regarding the condensing of the committee stage of the damages return on investment bill. Obviously, um, the committee are, are, resistant, are reluctant to do that, um, uh, despite, obviously, the request coming through from the Department, or from, yeah, from the Justice Department. Um, I suppose the, the view that I would have is that it's, it should be very much up to individual committees how they deal with their items of business um, and Perhaps it shouldn't be what we're told necessarily from the depart from each of the departments. It's, it's within the remit of, of the of the committee. Um, I suppose I, I would have a certain amount of, that, of empathy for the justice committee with regards to that. I don't know if other members have any comment. Maybe some of some of you do sit on that committee. Um, anyone any comment, um, Mr. Muir? Thank you very much, Chair, and uh, I note your comments, but I also would say we are the Infrastructure Committee, and this is a matter for the Justice Committee. So, you know, uh, on, we've received the correspondence, but, you know, this is a matter for the Justice Committee to take up with the Department rather for ourselves as the Infrastructure Committee. Yeah, and, I, and, I think, and that's, that's a fair point, but I do think, I suppose, we can have a certain amount of um, consideration for them in so much as, um, you know, how... Each, each committee deals with their business is very much in relation to, to them. Um, um, but I suppose the point that I, perhaps that's being made is the fact that you know, the direction is being given by the department rather than for the committee to decide. But I appreciate those comments. Anyone else? No? Mr. Boylan? Mr. Boylan? No. Mr. Boylan? It's on a different issue, Chair. Different issue, okay. In correspondence, yeah. Go ahead. Chair, just related to page 77, the, the COVID restriction scheme. And I see there in VSNA identified 49 taxi operators and drivers who have submitted applications to invest NA under the uh, Part B out of, of these 49 applications. One has been paid, 13 have been rejected, and 35 are presently being assessed to establish their eligibility. Uh, clearly, Chair, I don't I think, think there's enough support, so I would like the support of the committee to write to both ministers, obviously showing the concerns, but to find out uh, what's the most recent figures or, or how that's all operating, I, um, I'd like the support of the committee to find out what's going on there. Okay, Chair, okay. Chair I, would like, I would like to support that as well. Um, like Cahill, I'm getting a lot of contact <coughs> and communication from again taxi drivers and taxi operators and you know this ongoing thorn props in our side of having to keep raising this um and it's ping pong and it seems between the two departments and the two ministers so the fact that only one taxi operator has been paid like yeah i find that shocking at this stage so we do need to find out why that is the case and ask whoever is responsible they, uh, has responsibility for this, which in this case, it's the economy minister, and um, that this needs to be resolved. And the infrastructure minister and the economy minister needs to just sit around the table and sort this out. Okay, we're just sort of a note around that. Obviously, that that piece of correspondence was dated the 12th of March, so we're, we're a month down the line from that. So you would like to think that, that those figures are, are improved yeah, during that period. No. But I could ask for an update. We can ask for an update. I'm happy to do that. And obviously, the, minister, the infrastructure minister will be at this committee next week, um, so we can put some of that to her as, as well. Okay. Um, item at page 81 is a report from Electricity Association of Ireland. So, members are content, perhaps, that we consider that as part of our inquiry um, and at the stage whenever um, a, a number of pieces probably are, are with us. Uh, we may want to um, call witnesses at some st at within the next few weeks. Um, so maybe just consider that if members are, are happy at that point. Um, at page one hundred and seventy-seven, 
we have correspondence from the minister and again at page 223 so there are a number of issues and obviously within that um, there is the issue the ongoing issue as Martina has said with regards to support particularly for the bus and coach operators uh, and for taxi drivers and um, I suppose what the rolling scheme will, will look like and if there is going to be one because obviously um, the restrictions are still in place and will be for some time, particularly for the bus and coach operators. Have members any comments to make on either of those pieces of correspondence from the Minister? Um, Ms Kimmins. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, and I suppose just to kind of um, concur with your comments around the bus and coach operators as well. I mean, it was disappointing. I had written to the Minister a few weeks back to see was there any underspends and there's 1.5 million was handed back um and from the, the the last scheme so it, it's so important that uh, any new scheme takes into account all of the issues that um that the the bus and culture operators have been raising and the other one is just around mot issues it says in the correspondence that the, about the demand for testing is high um due to customers who don't require a test booking an appointment um, and I, I do appreciate the DVA are currently contacting customers and cancelling tests for those actually who still have TECs. But I do think there could be um, there is room for a wee bit of better communication to try and you know to help people understand that situation. That would maybe take the the onus off um, DVA having to do that as well. So just wondering if we could if the department could look at to see if there's any better ways of improving communication. Because um, I know I've been contacting I'm sure others by people who um, are due their MOT and can't get booked in. So something to try and help with that process, maybe to try and communicate that out a wee bit better, um, if possible. Okay. Members content with that? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Kelly. Mrs. Kelly, we can't hear you. Apologies for that. It takes me a while to find the icons on these screens. I'm very sorry. Um, I, I just was saying that uh, I've no difficulty in trying to get the communications and all right, um, because obviously if the, if the communications right, there's less work for us because people then get a better understanding of timeframes, etc., and, and that's critical. But um, I, I just wonder, can we, if we are writing to the minister around the schemes, can we be also uh, as a committee seek assurances that? Um, that there's been robust procedures put in place because I do know there are some concerns around how some of the schemes have spent uh, monies and uh, I know um, that some people have had are now being requested to repay grant aid so I think uh, that's very unfair as well so if we get the robust scheme right and a proper set of principles to begin with and as Martina says learn the lessons from previous schemes or Liz said uh, and, and, and incorporate them into any new scheme but I would also want to uh, just be assured by the minister that robust uh, mechanisms are put in place that there's no comeback either for the department nor indeed the applicants okay members content okay um mr boylan no chair the, the issues raised was just in the recent mot that that liz and, and dolores has meant so i'm happy enough for that approach okay thank you okay mr muir Thank you very much. Uh, it's on another issue, if it's okay. Yes, of course. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, it's 5.16, which is the A5 Western Transport Corridor. And I was going to maybe suggest, uh, I don't know whether members would be agreeable to, that we invite officials in to discuss this because there's obviously uh, a myriad of issues around this that we would want to be able to examine. And I think that would be a useful uh, opportunity to engage with officials on the issue. Okay, and perhaps we could include York Street Interchange in that as well. Yeah, yeah I think that would be useful, yeah. Okay, any other issues? Just, um, just draw your attention to correspondence. Yeah. Okay, Ms. Uh, uh, maybe um, it, it might be in this section when you're talking about um, the other two items to ask for some kind of communication with regards to the decision about the A5 going into another review, another inquiry, four inquiries in 15 years. This is most disappointing for, um, for those who have campaigned, myself included, for the A5 along that route. And this was brought to our attention, I think, since our last meeting, 
And therefore, um, I just would like it noted that we are deeply disappointed that we're going into another inquiry for the E5. Okay. Well, and again, I suppose those issues can be raised at next week's meeting as well, with 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 the, <coughs> as well as bringing officials at a later date. Um, further correspondence tabled um, from Alex Easton, just re regarding the sale of Portivo Reservoir by Northern Ireland Water. There's obviously a number of issues in relation to that. If members are content, we could pass that correspondence. Um, I suppose it, it is very much cross-cutting, so within our own the Department of Infrastructure, but also um, in, has implications for DERA and for um, finance. So if members are content that we, um, we circulate that correspondence um, for response and comment. Okay. Members, anything else they wish to raise during correspondence? Okay. Content to note then the... Um, the way forward uh, as, t as tabled um, as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Moving then on to item six, which is subordinate legislation. Um, it's our LSLs, which are not subject to assembly proceedings. Chair. Mr. Boylan. Sorry, Chair. Just on one point on page 60 in terms of the One Planet Development PMB. Um, in, in principle, I don't have any issues with it. But there's one question I'd like to ask the department in terms of their ability to monitor the carbon footprint of small holdings. So can we ask in relation, just in relation to that PMB, and I, I would support the principles of it, how is the department going to monitor the likes of, say, small holdings, or what way are they going to monitor? How, how would that come about? Could, could we put that question, please? Okay. I mean, there's probably a number of questions in relation to that, which... Um we may have the opportunity to speak to um, to Mark Durkin about if this obviously goes okay, through yeah. that stage. But so, um, I think it would be useful thanks, to have Chair. that information in advance, if that's a query. Okay, brilliant. Great, thank you very much. So moving then on to um, page 314, which is the SL1 for the road races at Knocka Hill climb at the at order northern ireland 2021 and sl1 on street parking residence parking zone rugby road college park avenue area belfast amendment order northern ireland 2021 um, the proposals are not subject to assembly proceedings um, the sl1 the road races knocker hill crime order northern ireland 2021 was agreed by correspondence on the 23rd of march um, so this is really just for the purpose of having a formal record of the agreement. So are members content with the proposals and statutory rule? Mr. Beggs, do you have your indicated? Yes, I, I'm, I'm, I'm content uh, at this stage, but a local resident who didn't want to disrupt uh, the races uh, and this year did indicate to me uh, some concern in that the guidance we've been given is that the promoter is expected to consult local residents and take concerns on board. They have received no communication whatsoever and they are all being locked in their home for a 12-hour period where they're unable to get out to work, etc. They actually have to, on some occasions, park their car outside the, the area. So uh, my question is what I would ask that we would seek from the department is how do they monitor whether or not promoters actually do any consultation with the public. Okay. We'll raise that query. Members content with the proposals for the statutory rules? Yep. Okay. Great, thank you. Moving then to item seven, which is SL1, the Lake Street Largan Abandonment Order, Northern Ireland, 2021. It's at page 319. The proposal is subject to negative resolution procedure. The rule will abandon an area of 151 square metres of footpath between numbers 81 and 83 Lake Street Lurgan. The proposal has been requested by a developer to allow for the erection of dwellings and realignment of the existing footpath. There have been no objections to the proposal. Um, are members content with the proposals for the statutory rule? Agreed. Chair. Yeah, content, but just there's no there's no map with that one for whatever reason. Just that one specific. I have no issue, and I presume Dolores would obviously know that area better than me. But 
you know, a tick or a gate on some of that. I have no issue, but it's just there's no map for whatever reason or drawing. Okay. Content. Moving then to item eight, which is SL1, the Common Market Hill Road, Newton Hamilton Abandonment Order, Northern Ireland 2021, and it's at page 323. The proposal is subject to negative resolution procedure. The rule will abandon an area of 414 square metres of road in front of the old Newton Hamilton Livestock Sales Market Hill Road, Newton Hamilton. The applicant has planning permission for a filling station convenience store on the site. The area to be abandoned is unregistered and following a search it appears that the department does not have title to this land. The Roads Division carried out um, initial consultation exercise in 2016 and received a number of objections. Following completion of the required statutory consultation process in early 2019, which included publication of a notice in respect of the proposed abandonment in the local press, no further objections were received during the objection period. As part of the legislative process, the comments received in 2016 were treated as objections and Roads Division replied to the objectors asking them to withdraw their objection. No responses were received. The department is satisfied that the appropriate processes have been followed in relation to the proposed abandonment and the issues raised by the objectors have been addressed fully. Um, do members have any comments in re regard to that or are you content um, with the proposals? Yep. Everyone's content? Yep. Okay, agreed. Thank you. Moving then to item nine, which is subordinate legislation, SRs not subject to assembly proceedings. There are four statutory rules um, and they're at page 328. SR 2021-77, the Parking and Waiting Restrictions, London Dairy Amendment Order, Northern Ireland 2021. SR 2021-78, the Parking and Waiting Restrictions, Carrick Fergus Amendment Order, Northern Ireland 2021. SR 2021-79, the Parking Places, Loading Bays and Waiting Restrictions, Coleraine Amendment Order, Northern Ireland 2021. And SR 2021-80, the Road Races, Knocker Hill Climb Order, Northern Ireland 2021. Just note that the statutory rules, unless they've, if, just to note these, unless you have any issues at this stage, no? Everyone content? Yep. Okay. Agreed. Thank you. Moving then to SR 2021-57, the Planning Development Management Temporary Modifications Coronavirus Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2021, at page 343. The committee considered the proposal for the rule on the 3rd of March, and we were content. The rule is subject to negative resolution. There's been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with the rule? Are there any issues? No indications. no indications, all content. Okay, thank you. So the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2021-57, the Planning Development Management Temporary Modifications Coronavirus Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2021, and there's no objection to the rule. Thank you. Moving then to item 11, which is SR 2021-62, the Bus Operators Coronavirus Financial Assistance Regulations, Northern Ireland 2021. And it's at page 352. So the committee considered the proposal for the rule on the 24th of February, and we were content. The rule is subject to negative resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. The examiner of statutory rules has advised that the department has acknowledged that the regulations were laid in breach of the 21 day rule, explaining the reason for the breach which occurred in the context of the coronavirus pandemic. The examiner is content that the department on this occasion provided a, st a satisfactory reason for the breach. Are members content with this rule? Sure, sorry, there's been interference here. I can't, I couldn't hear that part, sorry. Um, somebody, somebody must have done. Someone's not on mute. Just make sure you're all okay. Which part of it did you not hear, Mr Boylan? 
Dude, all <laughs> of it? Couple, it just broke there in the last couple of minutes. To be honest with you, I mean, some I don't know where. It sounded like somebody was typing or something, but it was something I couldn't just in. I couldn't couldn't okay, hear. Well, to be honest, I'll run through this again quickly. So this is the the SR twenty twenty one sixty two, the bus operator coronavirus financial assistance regulations, Northern Ireland, twenty twenty one. Um, we considered the proposal for the rule on the 24th of February 2021 and we were content. The rule is subject to negative resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was, ex was considered by the committee. The examiner of statutory rules has advised the department has acknowledged that the regulations were laid in breach of the 21-day rule, explaining the reason for the breach which occurred in the context of the coronavirus pandemic. The examiner is content that the department on this occasion provided a satisfactory reason for the breach. So I'm just looking for members to indicate if they are content with this rule. I know that members obviously had issues in relation to it, but um, generally, but I suppose in the round we're content to proceed given the fact that it was going to give support to the industry. Is that fair enough? Yes. Fair enough. I think somebody else is looking in. Miss Kimmins? Yeah, no, Chair, thank you. I know I touched on it earlier. I suppose just to reiterate that point that there was um, quite a large underspend. And I think even um, in terms of the department's expectations that the scheme underperformed and so many operators weren't able to get any funding. So it's just, I think, to, to, to kind of reiterate that point that we need to look at it again and I mean there needs to be a, a scheme that that actually enables people to access the support but other than that content with with the rule. Okay members are content that the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2021-62 the bus operator coronavirus financial assistance regulations Northern Ireland 2021 and has no objection to the rule so we're agreed on that um, and obviously we can include those comments in our correspondence to um, the um, department and reiterate them again, obviously, to the minister next week when she's in attendance. Okay, so members content. We'll move then to item 12, which is our briefing from Waterways Ireland, um, tabled at page 40. And we will welcome via Starleaf um, John McDonald, the chief executive officer, Joe McMahon, the. So if we can welcome, obviously, that was John McDonald, the Chief Executive Officer, Joe McMahon, the Director of Technical Services, and um, uh, John Gillespie, the Northern Regional Manager. Um, you're all very welcome to committee today. Joe McMahon isn't here? Yeah, it's John McDonald and Joe Gillespie. Okay, so if I can invite um, John to um, make a presentation and then uh, members will follow up with some questions. You're very welcome to the committee this morning. Thank you. Okay, can, I, can I call John to, um, to open up with an opening statement? Them to move them to the spotlight. You can't hear me. Hello. <laughs> okay, but I can't hear anybody. They can't hear me. We can hear. Yeah, we can hear you. There's no sound. Okay, hello John, can you hear us now? There isn't any sound, so I'm on the screen. They can see me on the screen on the left hand side. But uh, well, I can't hear them, and I don't know if they can hear me, to be honest. We, 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 can, give us the audio. we can hear John. Thank you. 
<laughs> okay, so none of us are saying that's not that then it doesn't sound like it's probably there. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay, well then if there's a problem on this end. I'm sorry? Are they both in the same building? I wonder if it's possible for them to yes. maybe change rooms. Yeah, but all the guys in the same building, is it? Not the same building, right? Joe, can you hear us? Joe, can you hear me? Yes, I can. John has an audio problem that he's not receiving. John, are you receiving okay. that? Yes, I have everybody now. Great, that's thank great. You. Okay, thank you. Very, thank you, Joe. You're very well, John. You're very welcome to the committee, uh, along with Joe. And if it's possible, if you would like to um, to make your presentation, and then members will follow up with some questions. Okay, so thank you very much, and good morning to the chair, and good morning to the members. My apologies for the start. I had an audio problem on my end. So first of all, to say my name is John McDonough. I'm chief executive of Waterways Ireland. I'm joined today by two colleagues. So one is Joe Gillespie, who's our Northern Regional Manager. And I'm also joined by Joe McMahon, who's our Technical Services Director. Um, what we're proposing to do today is take it through the presentation content on a page by page basis. And that's on the basis that you have it, and that you can refer to the page numbers on the bottom. And what I'd like to do is to start off with the first section, which is to give you a little bit of uh, a little bit of background about who we are and what we do. And then we're going to move into a section in the middle, which has lots of pictures, which we'll go through pretty quickly. And what we're hoping to do there is to give you a sense of perspective around the kind of projects and delivery, and maintenance, et cetera, across our navigations um, since 2016. And the reason we've done that is because we understand you haven't had a presentation since 2016. So we're obviously gonna try and move through five years pretty quickly. And then towards the end, we've got a couple of slides about the now and the future, which I'm happy to take you through. So that's the basis of how we ho hoping to proceed. So if you're comfortable with that, I'm going to assume that you are. And I'm going to move, first of all, and take you through, if I can, uh, slide number, page number three, which is called About Waterways Ireland. So just to spend a moment on this. So first of all, we're the largest of the six uh, implementation bodies established under the British-Irish Agreement in 1998. Uh, we're a cross-border navigational authority, so we're responsible for over a thousand kilometers of navigable waters. Um, and the remit that we have is for the management, maintenance, development and promotion of those thousand kilometers, principally for recreation purposes. And I'm going to direct you, if I can, to the map on the right-hand side of the slide, which actually shows you where the waterways that we have within a remit. So starting at the top, Number one is the lower ban. Coming down to number two is the Ern system. Moving on down to three is the Shannon Ern system. Stretching the whole way down to number four, which is the Shannon. Uh, number five is the Royal Canal. Number six is the Grand Canal. And number seven is the Barrow Navigation. So I'm pausing just to give you time to understand that that is the remit in terms of the locations of the waterways. Um, moving on. Uh, we employ 300 permanent staff across different offices and sites which are close to the navigations themselves and then we complement and increment uh, those numbers with seasonally recruited staff which reflects the kind of seasonality uh, of the job that we have. Uh, our headquarters are here in Enniskillen where I am today. We have regional offices in Carrick and Shannon, Dublin and Scarif. Uh, last year approximately three and a half million uh, people used our waterways in some capacity, so that's either on water or off water. Um, we create annually social, economic, and environmental well-being value of 560 million. Um, the current valuation of the rebuild cost of our infrastructure assets is estimated at 1 billion. And if you have time and you're inclined, you can find out more about us by clicking on our website. So I'm going to take you from slide three to slide four, if I can, and just cover up at a high level our governance structure. 
So ultimately, uh, the authority that we report to is the North South Ministerial Council, which is uh, assisted by the Secretariat in Armagh. Uh, we have two sponsor departments. So we have the Department for Infrastructure in Northern Ireland and Minister Nicola Mallon. And in Dublin, in Ireland, we have the Department for Housing, Local Government and Heritage. And we have two ministers there, uh, Minister O'Brien and Minister Noonan. And then within the Waterways Ireland governance structure, we have a chief executive who's myself. We have an accounting officer who again is myself. And we have an audit committee with an independent chair who's called Karen Kelly. So that's our governance structure. If I take you to slide five, uh, we have tangible and intangible assets. I'm not going to spend too much time on this one. Left hand side, the, the physical assets that we talked about earlier on are valued at about a billion and they they run across about 20 principal assets so everything from bridges to culverts to lock gates so pure infrastructure assets we have financial assets which are assets funded from government or executive third parties and then income that we generate ourselves as i said earlier we have 300 permanent staff they're dispersed across two different jurisdictions um, we have different currencies, different service services, different policies, different terms and conditions. So there's a certain amount of complexity there. We have an intangible asset around the brand, corporate reputation, and we have an intangible asset around the know-how, or what I call the expertise, core competency. I'll move you to slide six if I can. So this is to give you a sense of the operating framework. So we, we, we do have a requirement to engage with multiple key stakeholders. So you can see at the top, we have the North South Ministerial Council coming down through sponsor departments, finance departments, uh, trade unions from an industrial relation perspective, and then obviously our own people. So that's just to give you a sense of the environment. If I go to slide seven, page number seven, I'll spend a moment on this because it's a little bit busy. So this is trying to give you a sense of some history, I guess, and what we're doing here on the left-hand slide of slide seven is we're showing you um, our maintenance and capital spend uh, from 2010 to 2020. And the way that we've done this is we've rebased 2010 to 100 so that we can show you the kind of trend across the 10 years. And what you can see on the left-hand side, um, uh, you can see that both lines uh, significantly declined from 2010, particularly around 2014 and 2015 when our capital uh, funding reduced very significantly. Both of the lines then kind of came back from 16 and 17 and 18 onwards in and around 70% of the 2010 number. And in latter times in 2019 and 2020, and actually continuing into 21, there's been some uh, smallish incremental growth in funding. So that's to put it in perspective for maintenance and capital. The this, this slide on the right-hand side is looking at this through a different set of eyes. So this is an international benchmark comparator um, with the organizations you can see mentioned there. And what this is doing is it's looking at our total expenditure, a, a measure per kilometer of navigations. So we try and actually have a, a common benchmark. And you can see here um, that the range of expenditure runs from, in our case, 31,000 euro um, per kilometer, um, up to 151,000 uh, per kilometer on the Scottish canals. The average is 113,000 uh, euro uh, per kilometer. So we're significantly off the benchmark number. Uh, I'll take you through, if I can, to slide eight. Uh, again, the format is somewhat similar. We're looking here at resources or numbers of people. So on the left-hand side, you can see that the slide is indicating along the top a red line, which is called a remit target. So we were remitted from uh, way back at the start, uh, 20 years ago, to have 381 permanent uh, uh, resources. We've never had 381, certainly since 2010. You can see the numbers along uh, the bars there. You can see how they dipped down to 277 in 2017. And you can see in the last couple of years, particularly, that we're beginning to rebuild capacity in the organization. And again, if you go to the right hand side, this is looking at that from the perspective of what I call international benchmarks. And what we're doing here is we're comparing the number of employees across the length of 
the navigations within the responsibility of each navigation authority. So we're saying that we have 0.3 of an employee per kilometre. The average across them all is 0.5, and you can see in Scottish canals, it actually reaches out to 1.1. So again, from a resource perspective, in terms of numbers of employees, there's very significant gaps there. I'm going to take you to slide nine, if I can. So slide nine is giving you some insight into the money, as I call it. So we're looking here, um, again, going back to 2016 on the bottom, taking you through to 2021. I suppose if I was to point to something there, I would say if you take the very last number at the bottom, that's showing current total. So in 2016, you can see that the funding was 23.246 million, and that's been growing in latter years, and our funding now is at 27.758 million. If you go to the top half of the slide, uh, and I'll stay on the right-hand side first, current funding is based on the proportion and allocation or apportionment of waterways within each jurisdiction. So in simple language, 85% of the waterways are in Ireland, 15% are in Northern Ireland. So the current funding is provided from departments based on that apportionment. So we get 15% of our current funding from Northern Ireland, and we get 85% from Ireland. If you go to the left-hand side on the top, capital funding is different. So capital funding is allocated on the basis of where the project actually happens. So you can see over the years that that moves around a little bit, depending on the uh, capital program in either jurisdiction. Yeah, if I go to slide 10, uh, I didn't want to have the presentation and not make a reference to COVID. Um, uh, simply put, uh, we've had a COVID project team in place uh, from right from the start, over 15 months now, approximately. That project team meets regularly. It makes decisions in relation to COVID um, for all of our staff. Uh, we moved our office-based staff to home working around the 23rd of March, uh, 2020. So over a year ago at this stage, that was pretty seamless. We had the technology, it worked well, and people continue to work from home. Um, our operational staff have been working on and off based on uh, public health guidelines. Uh, but throughout, we've had people working on essential services, essential maintenance across the waterways. And this slide is just trying to give you a sense of um, the look and feel of our response plan, which is a living document that we use within the organization and we've shared with our sponsor departments and also with the North South Ministerial Council for other bodies. So it's a living document that we update based on uh, changes to compliance, et cetera. So that's kind of where we are with COVID. Um, I'm now going to pause because we're going to do a quick overview of key projects on the Lower Ban and Loch Ern, And I'm going to hand over in the first instance uh, to my colleague, Joe McMahon, who will take you through uh, slide 12. Okay, thank, thank you, John, and uh, Chair and committee members. I suppose the first couple of slides here, I'm going to go provide a brief overview of capital infrastructure projects on the, the air navigation over the last number of years. and also including the Ulster Canal restoration project. As you see there on the left-hand side of slide 12, there's a couple of photo photographs depicting the River Finland dredging, which was completed in May 2016. This was the phase one of the Ulster Canal restoration between Loch Erne and Clonus. It involved intermittent dredging of the River Finn between Quibby Loch and County Fermanagh on the Erne, and Castle Saunderson in County Cavan. Approximately 3,500 cubic metres of material was removed from the river to a licensed tip in order to create navigation depth along a 2.5 kilometre stretch of the river. Moving then to the, the, the right hand side of the slide and, and, and the next couple of slides, the photographs will, will represent a continuing ongoing programme on the air navigation of increasing rearing capacity as well as a replacement programme for fixed mooring uh, sites with floating moorings. The top right hand side was the installation of approximately 36 metres of floating jetty at Glenoon on the Erne, and the bottom right hand side was the installation of 54 metres of new fl floating jetty at Nucklinny, also on the Erne. Moving to slide 13. 
then the focus remains on, on capital projects on the earn for the period 2016 and 2017. And uh, top right was, uh, sorry, first on the, the top left is the construction and installation associated with the provision of 83 metres of new floating jetty at Derry Roar. Bottom left uh, is the construction and installation and associated works with the provision of 126 metres of floating jetty at Carrie Bridge. Um, top right is the construction and installation of 113 metres of new floating jetty at Killy Haven. And then the bottom right is the construction and installation of 48 metres of new floating jetty at Henry Street, close to our HQ building. Moving on to slide 14, and as I mentioned at the outset, uh, I'm going to speak a little bit about the Ulster Canal restoration. And this was uh, part of the phase one. As I mentioned earlier, we completed the dredging of the River Finn in 2016. And following on from this in 2017, we commenced work on the construction of a new navigation arch at Derry Kirk Bridge on the River Finn. As you can see from the photographs in the slide that are presented, you have a before and after there in terms of the work. The work itself involved the construction of a new short section of lateral canal and the construction of a new navigation arch and associated road realignments at Derry Kirk Bridge. And this work was completed in 2018. Just for completeness in terms of phase one, and it's not shown on the slide, but the final piece of the jigsaw in terms of phase one of the Ulster Canal restoration was installation of a 50 metre new floating marine at Castle Saunderson, which was completed in 2019. And in terms of the first phase of, of the Ulster Canal restoration itself, creating two and a half kilometres of new navigation. If I could move on to slide 15 and hand you over to my colleague, Joe Gillespie, who will take you through these. Uh, good morning. Um, slide 15 is uh, on the top left-hand side. We have, uh, in 2018, we see a new offering on the urn. It's the development of the Blue Way product in a number of locations across the network. Uh, and it challenges people who have never been on the water to have a go, uh, that is, in the sense of getting out and being active. Here we see uh, the Inniskillen Water Activity Zone, which has been developed by Waterways Iron. It's a floating facility and it accommodates two activity providers offering day boat hire, uh, kayak hire, uh, water taxi, and also stand up paddling. So there's plenty, uh, plenty to entice people out on the water, especially young people. And in 2019, we know that some 6,000 people, and some of those absolute beginners, obviously, ventured out onto the water in one way or another, and that's adults and children. And there was some 40 schools participating in a paddling skills program as well. So on the top right hand side, then we have a new jetty at a new destination. So now directly accessible from the water, this landmark location of the castle and the museums in Inniskill will attract visitors on the waterway to stop off and spend some more quality time ashore learning about the historic castle or going to the museum or simply just taking time out to have a coffee break there. The jetty also enables coach parties that would arrive at the castle. Uh, to have a waterway experience as they would travel by water bus out to Devonish, which is a short distance out to the west of the town. And it also gives access to the town boulevard, which was uh, which encircles the island of Inniskillen. Uh, and the land there is in public ownership. It's in Fermanagh and Oma District Council ownership. And that factor has enabled the investment to happen. So bottom left and bottom right on slide 15, uh, those popular locations are upstream of Van Malek. They're in the interlock channel between Upper and Lower Lake, and they offer waterway users the chance to enjoy a tranquil rural experience as opposed to the town experience. The floating facility means that it is possible to use the jetties at almost any time of the year, regardless of the varying level of the lake. And many of our jetties are also used by anglers and generally outside of the main boating season. So if we move on to slide 16. Um, the bottom left hand image is, a, that's all about we're showing you there uh, an image of creating a new destination in Upper Locker at Kilmore Quay. We will have a new floating jetty installed at this site, which is already served by a council car park, as you can see. And we've had to deepen um, uh, the approach channel to the jetty location, which will be offshore there. And this jetty will effectively be the stop off point for the town of Listenesquee and for the waterfront water mill restaurant, which is nearby. On the top right hand side then, a new jetty with the new slipway is being provided at Balnalek, which is the first village upstream of Inniskill. Uh, this replaces a time expired timber fixed jetty. So craft numbers are growing on the urn, and this is a growing village. It's popular with boaters, 
There are onshore facilities there. There's children's play facilities and there's looped walking trails. So there's plenty to do ashore. Uh, there's also two large marina businesses there and there's a cruiser hire base there. And so we anticipate that this facility will increase the numbers of visitors stopping and staying over at Belnalek. Access to the water is vitally important, obviously, and the new slipway will ensure that a broad range of craft can be put into and taken out of the water safely. On the bottom right-hand side, then, this is an image of uh, the route around the Balik Marina. It's a project that would see the historic castle Colwell, which is in public ownership, linked to a Waterways Ireland Marina site in Balik, and then we cross into nearby uh, County Donegal, and we go along the northern side of Athero Lake, which is impounded by the hydro dam at Kathleen Falls in Ballyshannon. This would then be a cross-border greenway, linking the wild Atlantic way to these Erin sites, and would use a disused railway infrastructure in Fermanagh and a minor road in Donegal. A feasibility study has been completed, and we would look forward to working with both Fermanagh and Donegal County Council to advance that project. Uh, slide 17, then, if we can move on, which is the one that has uh, a well-known image there on the bottom left. So we'll start with the top right. It's a popular destination here with locals and visitors alike on Lower Loch Erne. That's Castle Archdale. It's in public ownership. There's a private marina business there, which we can see in this image. Uh, there's a small part of the jetty under our control, and we want to provide an upgraded jetty, upgraded jetty there at that point so that we uh, have somewhere for the visitor to land without charge. And we also have a pump-out facility there. If we look at bottom left and bottom right, these jetties are sites on lower Loch Earn, and they'll be extended to offer greater capacity for visitors that are going to experience the heritage sites on the islands. Uh, what are we doing along with Tourism NI, with the Council, with the Historic Environment Division of the Department for Communities? They've all collaborated in a Devonish Island partnership, a development partnership, and that has produced a visitor management framework, all embracing in the context or the proposition of tourism Northern Ireland, which is embrace a giant spirit. We move on to slide 18. Uh, that's lower down. So top left and bottom left. Um, here we are at a location which is midway along the lower band near Kilray, where we have a double chamber lock with its traditional timber lock gates. The upper photograph shows a new beam, a new gate freshly installed, awaiting the fitting of a timber balance beam which enables the lock keeper to push the, the, the gate in the traditional manner. The gates for the, the, this waterway are fabricated with artisan skills in our Port Na workshop. The built heritage of the locks has been recognized by Historic Environment Division as being of special significance in the Northern Ireland context, and there are now scheduled waterway infrastructure requiring HED approval and heritage skills to be employed when we maintain them. And on the right-hand side then, it's rather a dark image, but uh, you might understand why. We have an unusual asset at Port Na. It's an inline dry dock, inline with the channel, that is. It's not offline. That is to say, if a, cha if a vessel is in the dry dock, then the navigation would be closed. We understand that this concrete structure was constructed during World War II by the U.S. Air Force, and the navigation depth through the dock, uh, which is just on the upper side of the lock there, was, was reducing. So we had to intervene and reinstate the navigation depth. Uh, by removing the deposited material to a licensed disposal site. The scale of the dry dock is apparent now uh, when you see the foreman standing on the cleaned out floor there at the bottom in the bottom picture. Moving on to slide 19 in Lower Ban. Uh, one of the first things that Waterways Ireland did on the Lower Ban when it took control was to provide landing jetties above and below the locks to facilitate craft awaiting passage through the locks and they also assist canoes and portaging around the locks. Uh, the jetty at the cuts upstream of Coleraine had to be taken out of the water uh, for attention uh, using a long reach crane, as you see there, because of its hard to reach location right adjacent to the department, uh, the DFI Rivers Sluice Barrage at the cuts. The bottom left scene is uh, a new blueway trail at Port Lanome, which has also angling stands created through a partnership with the local council up there. Other waterside trails are planned along the ban uh, where lands are available and where funding can be accessed. At this point, I hand over to Joe McMahon for the image on the right-hand side of slide 19. The two photographs on the left-hand side of, this, of slide 19 are of Carnival Weir on the lower ban. Uh, this project commenced a number of years ago and is essentially about the repair of the weir, which has been assessed as in a critical structural condition. 
It has been an extremely complex pro pro project given the environmental ses sensitivities and the legis legislative need to conduct a new, or to construct a new all species fish pass as part of the Water Rivers Ireland has worked closely, closely over the last number of years with Rivers Agency, Ira Inland Fisheries, and the Historic Environments Division, and a number of landowners and interested stakeholders in order to develop this project. This ultimately culminated in planning approval in late 2020, and consequently the award of an enabling works contract that should be completed later this month. Um, we are currently progressing works on the tender stage for the In River Works, and will commence in this, which will commence in the spring of 2022. Because of the size of the weir and the nature of the works, these will be conducted over a two-year period, with completion expected in the autumn of 2023. As you can see there on the top slide of the weir, to the left-hand side, there is the lock chamber, and uh, currently and separately to the, the, the weir project, we are conducting emergency structural repairs to the lock chamber of the, of the weir, and, and these works are ongoing at present and will be completed later this month. I'll hand you back to Joe Gillespie then in regard to slide 20. Okay, so we're on slide 20, um, and we're talking about the maintenance of the navigation. The maintenance of a navigation involves attending to the various assets that altogether contribute to a safe waterway. Aids to navigation including navigation markers with, a, with their distinctive red and white head are, are often to be seen by boaters out on the lake. And these can be damaged by boat strikes, by ice flow or by floods. And we have specialized floating plant, some of which you might see there in the central images, um, such as the work boat on the urn, which enables us to get out onto the water safely and to maintain the markers or to place concrete sinkers, such as you see there on the left-hand side being fabricated for point moorings or uh, tranquility sites as they're becoming known. Regular maintenance of jetties is critical for the life of the asset and the safety of waterway users. So moving on to slide 21, um, some scenes of aquatic weeds. These scenes on the urn system, where since 2004 we have devised a weed management program to address the threat posed by native and later by invasive aquatic plants, possibly through the presence of the invasive zebra mussel, the nuttles waterweed, became the dominant aquatic plant threatening to choke the navigation channels and to sever links with the rest of the network. Having appropriate equipment to remove the, the weeds from the navigation is essential. And we see there on the right-hand side our weed harvester, or, uh, which is a specialist piece of kit. Uh, it's sized in order to be able to operate in a lake environment as opposed to canals or sheltered waters. The upper lake is designated as a special area of conservation so ahead of any harvesting work, there is much time to be spent in the preparation of plans and method statements and so on. And the support of our colleagues in our environmental section with their specialist knowledge proves invaluable in helping us to progress through all of the issues required to be addressed before we work in a designated aquatic environment. Okay, so Joe, I think I'll take everybody forward, uh, if I can, quickly to slide uh, 22, which is basically highlighting potential development opportunities in the future. So if I take you to slide 23, there's quite an amount on slide 23. I'm not proposing to cover every single picture, but I suppose if I highlight a small number, go to the top left-hand side. Uh, we've recently launched the Shannon Tourism Master Plan. We've done that with our partner, uh, Falsha Ireland, and 10 local authorities along the Shannon. Uh, total investment over 10 years is approximately 76 million euro. Most of that money is coming from Falsha and the local authorities. And I guess the thing to point out about that master plan is it's an exemplar plan in terms of what we want to have for each of the rest of the navigations. So that's relevant in terms of making you aware of that. Next to that, we have a bar of Blue Way. So it's a project that's currently underway. We're building 46 kilometers of Blue Way. And in future years, uh, the balance, we hope, of the extension of the Blue Way into Carlo, which is approximately another 70 kilometers. If I go to the Royal Canal Greenway, uh, that was launched during March. Um, it's the longest greenway in Ireland. Uh, over 140 kilometers. It runs from Minute down to Clondra, 
um, very successful launch, um, a project that uh, actually was in kind of a development for almost 10 years uh, with uh, funding from various departments, um, approximating 12 million euro. Uh, Joe is going to uh, refer to the Ulster Canal in a moment, so I won't go there. Uh, the next number of images are around uh, transformation projects that we hope to develop in and around Dublin and the Dublin Canals. Uh, equally, the next slide up is going to talk about the spiritual trail, so I'll hold on that. And then on the last one in Tullamore, we have an opportunity because of our land bank there and our location uh, to help to regenerate uh, uh, that particular town and improve uh, the harbour itself. So I'm going to move you to 24, uh, which I'll hand over to Joe. OK, again, slide 24. Um, for centuries, the waterways on the island of Ireland were the chief means of transporting people efficiently. And for this reason, many heritage settlements and sites are to be found along the waterways network. So a locker and spiritual trail concept has been developed whereby visitors might experience what it felt like to voyage along the waterways and to access uh, 11 identified sites of spiritual or ecclesiastic significance. Uh, these together could obviously become a visitor product in themselves. Waterways Ireland is actively working with the Locker and Landscape Partnership, and we will support Fermanagh Noma District Council in the development of this product in Fermanagh through the investment of uh, in additional capacity at the Devonish and Davies Island jetties. We will expand capacity there. Funding uh, is through the Locker and Landscape Partnership and provided by National Lottery Heritage Fund. In addition, then, we have a longer pilgrim way, which has been the subject of a feasibility study. And that would, and that's showing on the map there in, in the blue line. Uh, it would stretch for over 450 kilometers from the Shannon Estuary in the southwest uh, to Loch Derg in Donegal, as the map indicates. And the red dots along that route are the heritage sites of significance. And you can see there are quite a number of them along that route. So over to Joe McMahon now at this point. Thanks, Joe. Uh, slide 25. Uh, I spoke earlier about phase one elements of the Ulster Canal restoration. So I suppose now just to bring a bit of context to this and also other developments on the Ulster Canal that are the continued restoration of the canal to Clonus and indeed greenway developments beyond Clonus and some cross-border projects. Uh, the greenway section of the slide highlights the Ulster Canal restoration project itself. Um, in 2007, Waterways Ireland was given permission by the North-South Ministerial Council to explore the potential restoration of the Ulster Canal between Loch Erne and Clonus. Feasibility assessments were completed and planning applications were submitted in four separate to four separate authorities in 2011. Uh, consequently, planning permissions were granted by all authorities in, in mid-2013. As I explained earlier, the phase one element is complete to Castle Saunders and creating two and a half kilometres of new navigation between Loch Erne and Castle Saunders. Work has commenced on the implementation and delivery of phase two, which is approximately one kilometre of restored canal navigation between Clonus and Clonfad. Six million of funding for this phase has been confirmed from the Shared Island Fund, and we are currently awaiting a decision on our Rural Regeneration Development Fund application in the next few weeks for the balance of the infrastructure costs for this phase. It is planned to complete the delivery of the phase two element and, and the various parts of that phase by mid to late 2023. In relation to the remaining section between Castle Saunderson and Clon Fad, one million has also been secured from the Sherwood Island Fund to complete various studies to assist the future delivery of this phase in the future. I suppose then moving on to discuss the, the section depicted in red on slide 25, which is the remaining section of the old Ulster Canal between Clonus and Loch uh, At a meeting of the North South Ministerial Council in 2015, it was agreed that Waterways Ireland would lead on, on progressing development of Greenway along a corridor of the Ulster Canal in association with relative, relative councils and stakeholders. This has resulted in the establishment of a regional Greenway Advisory Group formed of local authorities in both jurisdictions, East Border Region Limited and Waterways Ireland has led the group delivering 
an Ulster Canal Greenway Development Strategy, which lays out a 190 kilometre network of, of off-road greenways across the centre border mid-Ulster area and anchored to the Ulster Canal route. It also builds pioneering work by Monaghan County Council in accessing Department of Transfer Transport funds to deliver in 2013 a Phase 1 Ulster Canal Greenway running 4.2 kilometres through Monaghan Town. Um, just in terms of our, our direct involvement in, in relation to Greenway Developments, Waterways Ireland continues to collaborate with its project partners, Monaghan County Council, Armagh City Banbridge, and Craig Borough Council and East Border Region to develop a Phase 2 Ulster Canal Greenway from Smithsborough in County Monaghan to Middleton in County Armagh. And this is funded through the Interreg V5A Sustainable Transport Measure. For a formal uh, request for additional funding to develop the Greenway was submitted to SE the UPP in April 2020. An integrated consultant team has been appointed to progress the route, selection and design. The prepared route for the Greenway was made public in July 2020, following a thorough route selection process and planning applications have been submitted for the section in County Armagh and the section from the border to Monaghan. The design and planning permission phase will be progressed for the section from Monaghan to, to Smithsboro in the not too distant future. That's okay, thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. So um, we, we've reached the end of our presentation, so I'm happy to hand back to the chair and for members to ask any questions and we'll do our best to answer them. Okay, thank you very much to, uh, to all of you for your um, very comprehensive um, presentation and particularly um, in relation to the the tour of the various sites and projects that you have been involved in and it really is quite unfortunate that this is the first opportunity that we have had since the assembly was restored that we could have a conversation with you with in respect of the work that has been ongoing um, and it's I suppose great disappointment that we haven't had the opportunity to, to visit with you yeah. and to see some of, of those projects in person but we do hope that that will happen in the not too distant future with um, relaxation and so on. So perhaps that we will get the, the opportunity fairly soon. Um, again, can I congratulate John on can I congratulate you on your on your um, your recent appointment? Um, I know that you have been in, in post in an interim capacity um, before that, but it, it's good to have that obviously um, now concluded as well, so that you can. Um, I suppose look to your, the future with regards to the work that you can, can be very much involved in. Um, you did indicate that we maybe would want to look at the website, which I did have a look at actually yesterday. Um, and I suppose I was, I was interested to know um, where you were with updating that with regards to um, populating it with information, because I do see that the, annual, the latest annual report was 2018. And um, also the, the corporate plan, which is there, is for 2017-19. And again, it's in draft. Um, we did have a, a discussion with the minister on the back of a, an NSMC stack sectoral meeting in, in December, where she had indicated that the Waterways Ireland 2022 corporate plan and the 2020 and 21 business plans had been prepared. And um, once they were going to be approved, obviously then go to NSMC. Could you give us an update with regards to those documents and where they sit within the organization? OK, that's fine. Thank you. First of all, and, uh, you're always welcome to come and visit us when, when uh, COVID enables people to do that. So just to be aware of that. Um, uh, specifically in relation to the business plan, the business plan was approved by our departments uh, for uh, 2021 um, uh, and also approved uh, by the North South Ministerial Council. So that, that's been through all the approval stages. Uh, the corporate plan has been approved by the departments um, and the finance departments, and it is going to be put before the North South Ministerial Council meeting, which I believe is on the 14th of May and uh, uh, the departments will seek approval for it. So that's where those plans are currently. Okay, and uh, will your website then be updated then to, to reflect yeah. all of that? Yes, it will. Okay, thank you. Um, we've, we've heard from the Minister um, yeah. the, the challenges that are going to be facing the department, particularly around resource uh, and the impact then that may have on, on capital spend. 
Could I just ask what conversations that you have had with the department around the budget and what the implications are of that for you? Well, we have a normal kind of planning process around the business plan. Um, and we also have what I call our regular monitoring meetings. So in both of those contexts, we would have discussions with our sponsor departments about funding requirements. Um, in relation to uh, funding currently, as you can see from the material that we presented you with, um, we've been growing uh, both our current and our capital uh, expenditure over the last numbers of years. Uh, we'd like to have more. I think that's pretty obvious from, from the material that I've sent to you. Um, we also, though, have other routes uh, to funding, particularly on the capital side, and that may not have been apparent from the slide that I showed earlier. And that's, that's a, what I would call a channel, which is called third party funding. So if we look back over the last numbers of years, and we included third party funding as well, you would see that that's a significant opportunity for us. So for example, uh, if I refer back to the Shannon Tourism Master Plan, over 10 years, there'll be 76 million euro of investment. Much of that investment is going to come from uh, uh, bodies and organizations outside Waterways Ireland, but it's going to benefit us. If you look at the Barrow Blue Way that we refer to, uh, 7 million for the project, of the 7 million, 25% match funding has come from the department in Dublin. The rest has come from various schemes. So we obviously want to be able to develop the opportunities that I showed you on the pictures. We can only do that if the funding exists. And we continue to have ongoing discussions with our sponsor departments about funding needs. I should say as well, um, and I'm conscious of the fact that it's 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 a short session in terms of overall time, and we've tried to kind of show you the perspective from 2016. But if 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 you look to the future, I should so say that we're coming to the end of the culmination of a 10-year strategic plan, which we will discuss with our departments uh, in May, and that strategic plan will obviously have a number of strategic priorities in it, and one of those priorities is around funding the funding model and uh, uh, the opportunities for us to be able to avail of alternative funding. Um, so those conversations will go on as well. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a continuous conversation we have with our departments and other third party uh, channels. Okay, and obviously there's an impact on you when we don't have multi-year budgets, if single year budgets for your planning. Um, what is the impact of that? Well, it, it, again, I'm going to break it out between current and capital. So um, the, the current budget, um, as I said, is based on um, the allocation of the waterways. So from a Northern Ireland perspective, 15% of the current expenditure will come from Northern, has come from Northern Ireland uh, every year. Uh, that would impact uh, predominantly non-capital items. So we're talking about salaries, rent, light, heat, those kind of uh, maintenance, those kind of expenses that you'd be aware of. If it's a, a capital uh, uh, fund and there isn't capital, well, then we won't be able to fund opportunities in that particular jurisdiction. It's as, it's as, simple, as, it's as simple as that. Um, just finally for me, obviously, um, there have been many negatives associated with COVID, but obviously the positive of that is actually people getting out and about and I suppose enjoying the environment, um, which um, will obviously mean that it will have an impact on the services that, um, that you provide. Would you perhaps um, be able to quantify the numbers of an increase of users um, of waterways facilities and how you've been able to manage that um, over the last year? Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you for asking that. So um, last year, we would have had unprecedented demand on certain navigations uh, and both on water and off water. So to give you some examples, if we take the off water piece first on uh, trails or greenways, we would have markers um, which are actually monitoring numbers of users on trails and generally speaking across uh, approximately 15 or 20 markers, we would have seen increases of uh, at least 20% uh, on average across the whole lot. In some particular locations, actually, uh, demand went up by 100%. If we come back on water and we look at specific locations like the Shannon, 
um, we probably would have had a record level of demand in uh, 2020, uh, particularly from the, the, uh, the cruise hire sector. Uh, and that really came down to the fact that uh, as a result of COVID, most people were looking for staycations. So there was a lot, there was a huge increase in domestic demand, which in alternate years probably would have gone elsewhere. In terms of managing, I think we managed it reasonably well. Um, we worked uh, uh, with local authorities, um, uh, in particular to service provision around service blocks, uh, all of our facilities, our toilets, et cetera, et cetera, car parks. Um, there was a little bit of stop starting depending on uh, public health guidelines and uh, where I suppose the difficulties might arise is, uh, for example, if we're in a, a restricted space and, for example, uh, there's congregations of people, uh, on occasion we had to take some actions and, for example, close a car park at a particular location because the level of demand was so high and people were congregating when they shouldn't have been. So there were a small number of instances of that. But in general, last year was a high demand year across off water and on water. And I think it was managed reasonably well. Okay, thank you very much. Can I call Ms. Kimmins? Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you for your presentation. It was definitely very informative. Um, I suppose just there's a couple of things I'd like to ask, John. Um, just firstly, to get a further understanding on where Waterworth, Waterways Ireland remit starts and ends, um, and who decides that, you know, and whether that, that you can get involved in other projects. I suppose an example from my own area would be the Albert Basin Park project, which is a highly anticipated project for Newry, and um, given its location, um, you know, along the canal in Newry, it's it seeks to reconnect um, Newry with its waterways and has huge potential. So it was just to kind of get a wee bit of more understanding on that, where you would come in on that one. Yeah, okay. So I'll, I'll answer the second part of your question first, if that's okay. And then I might actually defer to the two guys just to make sure that I, that I get the second piece right. So it's not in our gift to decide to take on additional elements to a remit. That's not in our gift. So Joe McMahon gave some examples earlier on around, for example, the Ulster Canal restoration project and the Ulster Canal Greenway. And I think what he said was the canal restoration uh, was something that was added to our remit in two, 2007 by the North South Ministerial Council. And he also referred to the uh, what I would call the extension piece in 2015, where the council asked us to lead greenway corridors along the Ulster Canal. So again, that came from the Northside uh, Ministerial Council. So ultimately, that authority comes from the NSMC. Uh, and it's not in our gift to decide we want to do A, B and C and we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. So that's, that, that's our point. Uh, we, we, get a number of, we get a number of questions from all kinds of people around th this particular point that you raise. And actually, part of it goes back to what I would call saliency around our brand the brand Waterways Ireland, as in, you know, people's awareness of the brand, people's awareness of the remit, people's awareness of the, what exactly is in it. Uh, and that's an issue that we're going to address going forward because we don't believe that that brand awareness is high enough and therefore people aren't educated or informed enough about what's in the remit. So we will take that on board separately. Uh, specifically in relation to your own area and your particular location, I don't believe that sits within a remit, but I am going to defer and just make sure I'm correct in saying that by asking either of the Joes to maybe confirm that for me. Joe Gillespie, yeah? I'll take that. Um, you're talking about uh, the Newry Canal and where it discharges into, or where it did in the past, or did link into Carlingford Lock. Um, the Newry uh, Canal is not within our jurisdiction. It links Loch Ney, as I recall, down to Carlingford. I think it's the oldest canal in the in in Britain and Ireland. Um, or the summit navigation. It's not. There have been calls in the past for Waterways Ireland to, for instance, uh, take over the navigation responsibility for Loch Ney, and the department did in the past uh, ask Waterways Ireland to undertake feasibility studies, and just to give them a, a picture of what that might cost. But uh, as John has alluded to, it's ultimately for the department in in that jurisdiction, I suppose in consultation with the other sponsor department to to conclude as to whether it's appropriate for what we're to take on an extra 
navigation, such as Loch Ney or the Newry Canal, or um, those are the only two that I can think of offhand that by Maelster. And the Lagan is the other one, I suppose. Yeah, I suppose, and you've kind of answered my question there, Joe, because it's one that has come up recently about um, the potential to restore and reopen the Newry to Portadown canal um but obviously that's not within your remit then based on what you've said there just I suppose the, the other thing that is is, is kind of a, a current issue is um the, the big projects of the narrow water bridge and the southern relief road um and i know you know because again it, it links into that area um there's been uh there's been community concern about um you know if there if there aren't lifting bridges how that would impact access to to the waterways in and around Murray, Carlingford Lock, and all of that. Is that have you been involved or engaged in any of that? Um, those discussions in terms of those big projects. So maybe I'll answer first, and again, to be fair to Joe, if that's okay. To, to the best of my knowledge, no. So unless Joe is aware of something else that may have been discussed either prior to my time or maybe informally, I'll just pass to him if I can. As far as I'm aware, and I'm looking over to Joe here, no, we, we haven't been consulted on any uh, structures that would be spanning the Newry Canal. Uh, when it comes to the Ulster Canal, it's a different matter, obviously, and we would uh, have a, an advisory role with the council there just suggesting bridge heights and that sort of thing. If there was a bypass, for instance, Monaghan Town bypass was created some years ago, and they did provide a bridge with sufficient air draft to enable the reconstruction of the canal at some point in the future. So... No was the answer for the Newry Canal. Okay, well that's great. Look, thank you both. I um, appreciate your answer, sir. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Buchanan. Okay, thank you, uh, Jojo and John. My question, a couple of questions here. On slide five, um, you referred to self-generated income, third-party income, and then obviously government income, or we'll call it North and South government income. What sort of money or budget figures do you get every year approximately on self-generated income, and where does that come from? Okay, so I'll answer the, 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 the last question first if I can. It comes from a variety of places within the organization. So it can come from rental or lease income. It can come from permit and license fees that we charge. Um, um, predominantly, that's what makes it up. Uh, but to put it in perspective for you, and, and I want uh, maybe I'll put it in perspective in so far as I reference the kind of international benchmarks. About six and a half percent of our total uh, budget, uh, the numbers that you saw earlier, uh, is actually from self-generated income. So that's the size of it, about six and a half percent of the total number. There is an issue there insofar as if we compare ourselves with our international comparators, for example, again, the Scottish canals, about 33 percent of their income would come from self-generation. And they do that across a whole range of things from uh, potential utility, broadband, uh, renewable energy, uh, and various other opportunities within the network that they've leveraged. So one of the things for us in our 10-year strategic plan, which sits within the funding model that I referred to earlier on, is actually for us to leverage more ourselves. And uh, one specific area where there's an opportunity to do that, which we're looking at currently, is within the revision of the bylaws. So the bylaws are the rules and regulations of all of our navigations. And without getting into it right now, because it would take quite an amount of time, it's quite complex. Uh, in simple language, they're all outdated and they need to be revised. And there is an opportunity there for us to grow our income on the back of that. But ultimately, over the next 10 years, we need to become more self-sufficient. Um, so I, I, I'll probably full stop it at that. That's okay. So, so, just for clarity, then on slide nine, the total figure is twenty-seven million seven hundred fifty-eight thousand. Does that include the self-generated six point five percent, or is that six point five percent on top of that approximately? Um, that's a good question. Um, uh, that would probably exclude, but I okay. clarify that and I'll send a note back to the chair just to be absolutely certain. That's fine. So, yeah, okay. I'm reading that as twenty-seven million odd based on the government subsidies effectively. Yes, and then, yeah, yes. Sort of yes. And I, but I will clarify that for you if you don't mind. No we'll send you a note. And then my next question is relating to numbers. You have 300 staff approximately currently, yes. and you want to increase that to 381, which is roughly, believe it or not, I worked it out, a 27% increase. Where are you going to get the funds to do a 27% increase in staff, and what over what period of time? 
Okay, so maybe to clarify, we're not looking to get to 381 per se. So uh, if I refer you to slide eight, so that we're just interpreting each other correctly. Yeah. So the remit number of 381 came from the original legislative piece that was put in place right at the start 20 years ago. Okay. So that actually sets out on a page okay. an organization structure for Waterways Ireland that has every post or every role which on it, which shows a structure from CEO downwards, and it all adds up to 381 people. We've never been at 381 people, and the slide on slide eight on the left-hand side is showing you how many people permanently we have each year. Yeah, that, yeah. So we're at 300 at the moment. We are trying to grow to 300 incrementally within the funding that we're given, and we do that on a prioritized basis relative to business need. And we've had some flex in being able to do that in 21 and 20, because we've had some additional funding to enable us to do it. Uh, but ultimately, we're not saying we're trying to get to 381. So what we are trying to do as part of a long-term plan is produce a workforce plan, and there'll be science around that, and that will identify specifically what it is we need in terms of resource for the next 10 years, and we will present that to our sponsor departments, and we will have a discussion about where we go with that. Okay, and another question on third-party funding then. Um, yes. You're getting, obviously, third-party funding. Obviously, it's not set, I presume, a same figure every year that can go up and down. What kind of money are you, are you talking approximately per year you spend? Obviously, it goes up and down in third-party funding, yeah. roughly. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. So third party funding refers specifically to capital projects. So just to kind of clarify that as well. So um, if we look at, uh, it'll depend on project and I'm, I won't be obtuse with you. I'll try and give you an absolute number, but uh, I'll, try, I'll try and give you examples. If we take the Barra Blue Way that we talk about there, the project total is about 7 million. And our government department was asked to match fund 25% of that. So a quarter of the 7 million came from Dublin and the three quarters came from a third party scheme, which happened to be the rural redevelopment scheme. So in that case, for that project, it's about five and a half million, which we spread across a couple of years, given the kind of duration of the construction piece. If we take something like the Ulster Canal that Joe referred to, uh, phase two uh, uh, costs roughly 12 million. And again, in that particular case, there's a match funding element, which I think is around 10%. So ultimately, about 11 million has got to come from somewhere. And the 11 million asked was originally in November last year, coming from the Rural Redevelopment Fund. Um, what subsequently the Shared Island uh, unit uh, provided 6 million. So we're now awaiting the announcement, which is pretty imminent about the balance. So in that particular case, that project, about 10 out of the 12 million is coming from third parties. So it depends a little bit on projects, but to try and answer your question, uh, in 2021, third party funding could be of the order of somewhere between five and seven million, uh, uh, depending on the projects. Okay, and, and final question you'd like to hear, of your 300 staff, uh, and many of those staff is involved, let's call it on the ground maintenance, maintenance activities, yeah. and how many yeah. do you then bring in, you know, contractors, subcontractors, et cetera? So, yeah. A bit of a breakdown of your 300 staff. Okay, very, very simply, if you were to think about it, about two thirds of the 300, so a couple of hundred people, are actually people working out in operational roles outside in the field, as I call it. So they do all of the kind of operational tasks to help with the maintenance and the project delivery. So about 200 outside, about 100 inside. When we bring in people seasonally, uh, it's uh, the, the people we bring in are people to do the operational work on the outside. So they could be lock keepers, water patrollers. Um, our season runs from roughly uh, late March, April through to October. So you're talking about summertime. So they're replacing people who may be on holidays, etc. So in that event, uh, we could bring in potentially another 30, 35 uh, uh, seasonal workers. Of that number, probably uh, the bulk of them would be, uh, not the bulk, but a good chunk of them would be for the Shannon navigation, where we would bring in people uh, to replace lock keepers. Um, so of the order of about 30. Thank you, Joe. Okay. Joe thank, you. Thank, you thank you for thank the you. answers, appreciate thank that. Miss um, Anderson. 
Um, thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for that presentation. I find it fascinating, and I'm delighted to hear that you have already secured six million from the Shared Future Fund. Uh, I think you're the first that I have heard. Yes. Or saying that you have had, um, uh, you have tied down that funding. So well done on that. Um, you'll not be surprised to hear that my Green Aid monster is out for Derry and Strabane because I think waterways are a great asset for, for particularly local leisure and tourism and you've outlined that very, very well. And so I want to, I naturally think um, around my own constituency. Now I'm conscious of you know, what you said or John in relation to some things not being in your gift. So this could be somewhat academic because when I looked at the map, and the map in your presentation, like it doesn't indicate, for instance, um, if there's anything around Derry, Straban or that area. So I was wondering, given that the two canals locally, for instance, here, like they date back hundreds of years in terms of Straban and Ballykelly, and they both still exist to this day. But I understand that in terms of the Straban Canal, I think it was around 2006, uh, that there was construction uh, to be done there. There was restoration attempts, but because construction was in a very poor quality state, the project failed. But I, I do believe another organization then, it was Japan and Lifford Development Commission. And mm -hmm. um, so could this be something that could potentially be within your gift or is it simply just out of range because it's not within your remit? Okay, so I'll try, I'll try and answer uh, with a couple of maybe just components there. So the first thing is you're correct about what you said at the beginning, which is that the shared island um, uh, funding, which was announced in December, is the first of that type of funding. Um, right. uh, just, to, just to clarify, you're correct there. And the reason I say that is because um, the Ulster Canal Restoration Project we would use the words, it's kind of like a shovel ready project. We can actually do things and get construction going. And I think that's recognized within the shared island unit, uh, which is why the announcement came at the time. And we continue to talk with the shared island unit in relation to the restoration project. So there's an ongoing conversation going on there. In relation to your own particular area, I'll say it again, and I, 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 it, it's, I don't really like saying it, but... Uh, it isn't in our gift to um, take on incremental projects outside the remit. So if our sponsor departments, for example, uh, came along and, and said there's a particular uh, navigation or a particular project that we think is complementary to what you do, we would have a conversation with them. And, and let's just say, hypothetically, it was going, that makes sense. Um, at that point, uh, our sponsor departments would probably have to work out a number of things. So one of them might be, you know, how is it going to be resourced? And then if they went through all of that and they felt that there was a particular uh, imperative around it, you know, they have the opportunity uh, with ourselves to make a case to the uh, North South Ministerial Council. Um, so that's probably how the process would work. I'm not sure from my limited time here that actually there's been very much of that that has ever happened. And truthfully, um, I, have, I, I have a portfolio of navigations that have a lot of opportunities on them. And I guess my goal is to try and maximize those with the resources that I have and make my case to kind of work with what I have. So um, I, I hope that gives you a sense of, of where we are. John, I can appreciate that that's uh, your focus, and rightly so. But my focus is dairy, and mm. stand up for dairy, and therefore what I have to do, and it's my responsibility uh, as an MLA, is to campaign so that we yep. get support to your attention. So I take that uh, on board. Uh, so I'd like to ask you in relation to the Ulster Canal, because that's going to be a great boost for tourism opportunities. Uh, great, I think, for, for the west of the band, and it's going to entice, as you would probably agree, visitors to travel outside of Belfast and get to see everything that, they, that the island has to offer. So whilst engagement has, um, or what engagement has Waterways Ireland had with the tourism bodies uh, in terms of trying to advance uh, the west of the band and all that it has to offer? 
Okay, I, I'm going to just push that one towards Joe Gillespie, if I can, um, yep. because I know that he's he's involved with, uh, with tourism in uh, Northern Ireland. So I'll just I'll push that to Joe initially. Could I just add before I answer that one that uh, you referred back to 2006 with the uh, Stravan Lifford Development Commission. Waterways Ireland at that stage was approached by those people, and we did offer whatever advice we could back then. So uh, um, I was hopeful, obviously, that that project would would see fruition. Uh, in terms of tourism, uh, we are working as best we can with the tourism NI and obviously south of the border with Fulch Ireland. Uh, in terms of the urn and the Ulster Canal, which Joe is obviously leading on, connects to the urn. Uh, at the moment, we are working in partnership with the council, Fermanagh District Council, and with tourism NI uh, in the development of a visitor experience development plan. John referred to a Shannon tourism master plan for the Shannon with the visitor experience master plan that Fermanagh foresees will look at the lakelands, but also look at the sparrows as well. So it's probably reaching closer to your own area in, uh, on the dairy side. Yeah. Um, so that, that's the work we're doing there. We obviously are supported by uh, our work by tourism on, on the, the ban as well. So it's, that's, that's just beginning and that will be going to tender shortly. Okay, Joe, thanks for that. It's good to get that update. Um, also, just finally, uh, John, Joe, or whoever, in the presentation, the information that we received, you stated that your funding profile had dropped to 50% uh, during, during the recession and that funding in most recent years um, has started to stabilise and grow. So has Waterways Ireland received any indication from the Southern Government as to the level of funding that you're going to receive, for instance, over the next five years, um, uh, as opposed to what we are handcuffed here with regards to the, the, uh, the not we don't have a multi-annual uh, funding, as, as the chair has said, that we only get year on year at this moment in time. So how does this impact, say, for instance, on your ability to plan investment? Okay, that's a great question. So uh, it, it impacts a lot in terms of planning. And I guess uh, one of the things that was concerning for me when I came in was that the, the, the planning horizons, if I could call them that, is either a one-year business plan or a three-year corporate plan. And uh, we have a lot of assets, which I think I kind of demonstrated to you, tend to have long uh, economic life cycles given the nature of the infrastructure. So we agreed at that stage to make a case to the sponsor departments to put in place a 10-year strategic plan, and they supported that. And that plan, as I mentioned earlier, will come to kind of fruition uh, in May, and we will sit down with the sponsor departments. And there are six kind of strategic priorities that we will be discussing with them. And one of them is around the funding model, and it covers quite a number of spaces. So uh, one of the questions earlier was around uh, how much funding do we generate ourselves? Uh, so that's a part of it. Uh, a part of it is is the difference between annual versus multi-year plans and that the benefits that longer term planning can bring. A part of it is uh, being able to say to sponsor departments, you know, here's our vision for the future. And on the back of that, we actually think, you know, over 10 years or five years, we need this amount of funding. So we, we will bring those conversations around the plan and all of those points to our sponsor departments next month. We'll have the conversations around it and then we'll have a better sense of what funding may or may not be there. Uh, so that's as much as I can say today, I'm afraid. Okay, thanks. Thank you for all of that information, uh, John, Joe and John again. And I really do appreciate the opportunity today to get the presentation from you. And I certainly am going to leave this committee now more informed about the fantastic work that Waterways Ireland is doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Beggs. Hello there. Um, again, Hello. thanks for your, your presentation. Uh, it's included some very enticing photographs, uh, and it's clear that you have developed. Uh, an attractive tourists and leisure leisure product. So so well done for that. Um, and and in terms of uh, greenways, um, a greenway alongside a, a water course is a very attractive feature which the wider community can 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 enjoy as well. So would that be normal? Do you try to to develop greenways alongside your waterways? 
Yeah, I, again, I'll, I'll, I'll answer maybe and, and, and also let the two Joes contribute. So uh, if you take the Royal Canal Greenway as an example, because it happens to be the longest greenway in Ireland, the canal has been there for 220 years. And the canal history, without getting into the detail, you know, it was there for a purpose in the, in the 1800s. It went into decline. Um, the canal remained there in a disused fashion, and then it was reinvested in and ultimately kind of came back into space in the early 2000s. Um, the, the Greenway development started there about 2010. So what we have there now, if you can imagine, is a linear canal that runs quite a stretch, 130 kilometers or so. And we have a greenway that runs along the stretch. So it's, it's like a linear greenway as well. So you can do on water or off water. And from an attraction perspective, that's very enticing for everybody because it enables an awful lot of accessibility to do different things. So as a model, it's a good looking model. It's easier to do when you have a linear canal, if I could describe it in that fashion. If we look at the barrow, the barrow at the moment is a navigation that's made up of a canal and the river. And at the moment, we're building 46 kilometers of greenway or blue way along it. And we hope to extend that. So again, that's happened there. In places like Leitrim and Fermanagh, for example, there are smaller stretches of greenways that are like trails. Some of them are like running alongside the water and some of them are a little bit adjacent to the water. So that tends to be where we're at uh, in an ideal world. You know, you'd have, you'd have the water on one side and you'd have the trailway next to it. Uh, it depends a little bit in the topography and various other things. In, in, in terms of your um, operating model, then, do you tend to develop the, the infrastructure uh, then allow uh, separate businesses to, to, to lease it and actually rent out the cruisers? Or are you involved in uh, purchase of boats and rental of boats as well? No, that's a good question too. So we're, we're, our operating model is, is predominantly about what I would call providing infrastructure and accessibility to water. So we don't, for example, get, have any involvement in uh, the, the cruise hire sector, uh, just to take an example. So we, 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 wouldn't, we would work with the cruise hire sector through their association, which is called IBRA, uh, which is like the Boat Rental Association, as we do with lots of other stakeholders. We'd work very closely with them, but ultimately we don't have an involvement in what I call revenue generation in that kind of a, a revenue generation model. No, that doesn't happen. Uh, and you mentioned you had a COVID group. I mean, it, it's foreign travels banned at present and is likely still to be problematic for many uh, this coming summer. Um, so uh, I would expect that when things open up again, things will, will be um, busy once more. And certainly our self-catering accommodation, we're all hoping, hoping will be opening very, very shortly. And that would include presumably cruisers um, on, on our waterways. So my question is how... Do you, as an organization, uh, try to protect the public from any aspects that um, uh, COVID might have in using the waterways? Yeah, so again, good question. Um, uh, we do a lot of external, well, we do a lot of internal and external communication. I think that's the first thing to space. So um, the, the normal route for communication within our waterways are what are called marine notices. And they're published either by our inspector, inspectorate or our marketing division. And they would go to all what I would call regular users of the waterways. So that's the first route. And because many boat users are using boats for many years, it's, it's kind of a well-established protocol around how we communicate. And within that, we would be very clear in communicating around what you should or shouldn't do by setting out compliance guidelines, etc. And... I, I think that's a well-developed, mature channel of communication that the people within it understand. Then we have what I call the broader general public. And what we try and do there is a mix of things. So we will obviously use social media uh, to publish uh, compliance guidelines so people understand when and where they can go, depending on where it is, which jurisdiction is in and which compliance guidelines are in place. And then we have staff that are uh, positioned uh, across our waterways uh, to be there to be able to give guidance or intervene if required. Um, 
it, 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 it's not without its difficulties. So I'll, I'll be honest about that. So I gave an example earlier on where you could have a particular location that's very attractive. I can think of one straight off Acres Lake, for example, which is a small location down on Leitrim, where you have a boardwalk that actually goes out over the water. And people love to walk on the boardwalk over the water. It's a, it's a very attractive place to be. It's got a small car park. So we, we, would, we would be aware of those type of locations and we would zone in on them and, and make sure that there is good adherence to compliance. Um, so it's a mix of communication channels and intervention by our own people. Uh, a final question around uh, financing of it all and, and cost implications. Um, I mean, I can see if the Ulster Canal was, was um, uh, completed, uh, it would significantly increase the, the uh, availability of, of travel with Loch Ney and, and, and the lower ban, et cetera, linking into all of, all of what you already have. So I, I'm interested to know what are your latest cost estimates for completing that, that connection. And then secondly, you mentioned that, that at present you're, you're only raising about 6.5% of your um, funding requirements. Um, is that an indication that there is considerable uh, potential of growing um, the users on, on the existing facility, never mind expanding even further in, in others? Okay, I'll, I'll try and answer the first question first, um, if I can. So I think the thing to be kind of, maybe I need to be really clear about is that uh, our remit uh, uh, remits us to um, take the Ulster Canal restoration water project as far as Clonus. So I, I just want to be clear to everybody that that's where the remit starts and stops. So we're looking at the stretch between uh, effectively Loch Erne and Clonus. And um, at the moment, we're doing that on a phased basis, if you can imagine, in like sections. Uh, the section at the moment that Joe talked about, which is Clonfad to Clonus, uh, the estimate there, the cost is 12 million. Um, uh, if that funding comes through as we anticipate, then we will obviously get into construction and look to avail of the planning grant that's there and get the work done uh, by 2023. So if you can imagine a piece of string, what we'd have at that stage is we'd have a starter phase, which Joe referred to as being completed in 2019, um, which is done uh, right back at Loch Erin. And then we'd have a piece at Clonus that's done. And what we'd have in the middle is a stretch that would need to be completed. If you take that stretch, which is referred to as phase three, um, there are very uh, high level cost estimates about that. Um, because we haven't uh, we haven't gone into phase three in terms of the detail yet, but at a very high level, uh, those numbers and I, I'm going to go to Joe McMahon in a moment, but those numbers are probably of the order of 65 to 70 million uh, to complete that piece in the middle. So if you look at the totality of the stretch that we're talking about to clone us, phase one, two, and three, and you add the three numbers up, we're probably in and around 75 or 80 million in total. Now, I'm going to pause, if you don't mind, because I don't want to set you astray, and I just want to check with Joe that, that I'm kind of there, thereabouts on the numbers. Pretty much, John, just, just a wee bit of a, a variance in phase three. I mean, phase one is complete, and the costs were of circa three million. Phase two, as John spoke about, uh, costs are of the order of 12 million. Uh, phase three, they're split into what we're looking at in terms of a number of, of different, I suppose, sub phases in terms of delivery uh, in relation to planning applications and indeed various complexities around landowners and construction. So, uh, I mean, there, there's uh, we have four sub phases within that. The costs for that phase could be of the order. And as John alluded to, these are very high level and indicative at this point in time because. We are currently conducting a number of studies uh, to bring more certainty to, to what and indeed the timelines because uh, the previous costs that we had done in terms of the restoration are quite dated now and dating back to the planning application. So the phase three elements of the order of about 90 million. Okay, so maybe to just clarify that, just to answer the question that I was asked directly, if we add up phase one, two, and three, that looks like to me, it looks like 3 million, 12 million, and 90 million, which in my language is 105. 
So I, 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 can you interpret, does that get us to Clonus or does that get us to Loch Ness? No, that gets you to Clonus only. So that's what I'm trying to be very clear about here. So I, I'm, try, I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying to make sure I don't, I don't mislead you. So we're talking about what sits within a remit, which brings us up to Clonus. And if I could try and address your second question. So your second question was around self-generated income, which I mentioned was about 6.5% of our total. Um, there are opportunities, I believe, over time to grow that. Um, that, again, is part and parcel of the long-term planning piece. Um, we will certainly look to leverage uh, opportunities in the future. I, I guess for us, the, 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 tip, the balance or tipping point is usually around what we do as a public body and uh, versus what's potentially available that may be commercialized. So we, we, we have to be careful about that balance. Um, but I, I do think that over the next five years, particularly, there will be opportunities to grow to six and a half percent. Yes. Thank you. OK, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Boylan. OK, thank you, Chair. And thanks very much for your presentation. And, uh, John and Joe, I'm glad it, it uh, unlike some of the other MLAs, um, the Ulster Canal is going to come up my way, so I'm happy enough. And I mean, I know there's some some encouraging projects. Um, I just want to start off with uh, it's, these these waterways we have are wonderful assets, and I'm, I'm just wondering, um, obviously through COVID and, and post COVID, have have you actually um, been working with the tourism board in terms of a, of a new plan out of COVID? And trying to, like you mentioned, staycations and all in the numbers. Is is there? A, a, it maybe not be your remit, but there's a good opportunity here uh, post COVID to try and encourage people, more people, to use the waterways because I think they're fantastic assets. I mean, just just that wee question in terms of have you thought about that, or is, is it, it maybe I'd say your remit to be honest? You know. No, I think I think it's uh, I think I can address that. And again, I'll, I'll, if I if I need to, I'll defer to the guys. So, so a couple of couple of ways of answering that. The first way is I referred earlier on in one of my answers to the fact that brand awareness around Waterworks Ireland is very low. Uh, and I mean that I mean that in all of the metrics. So if we compare our brand awareness with either other organizations in Northern Ireland or other organizations in Ireland that are kind of doing similar things, the brand awareness piece is low. So the first thing we have to do is build a brand and that allows us to communicate to the general public what it is we have to offer, because I, I, we, I don't think we've probably done, done that well enough. So that, that's the starting point. And on the back of that, we can then promote the waterways uh, to new segments. So to give you an example, we did some research work before Christmas time. We have a good sense of the segments. So we have some very dedicated users who know all about the waterways. We have some who don't know anything about the waterways. And then we have a segment that's about 27% of the population of Ireland and Northern Ireland to say they're very interested in the waterways, as you're indicating, but they've never used them. So there is a segment out there, which interestingly, in, in terms of how it's measured in the research, tends to point to young families, if I could describe them as, as that. So that segment is particularly interested in using the waterways and learning more about it. So that's a target segment for us in terms of how we want to build the brand and build communications to reach out to that segment to help to develop. So that's the first thing. I guess the second thing is working with, for example, uh, the Shannon Tourism Master Plan, we now have a, a kind of an exemplar template and an operating model to help us to do this and different navigations. So that plan took about two years to put in place. As I said earlier, it's about 76 million of investment. It's predominantly investment in, in, in promoting tourism. So you're talking about promoting tourism the whole way along the stretch of the Shannon River, which will help small businesses, large businesses, the boat hire sector, you know, uh, people who want to hire bikes, coffee shops, et cetera, et cetera, quite a, quite a range. And in the way that we operate within that model with Falsha and the 10 local authorities, we believe that there's a model there that we can use in the future for other navigations to create the same effect. So though, so although tourism is not specifically a remit, in what we do and the way that we do it, 
we can certainly contribute to that going forward elsewhere. So, so yes to that. Thanks very much. And I just want to be specific because it's it's um, of a keen interest. And in terms of the Ulster Canal Green Mist, um, mm -hmm. and I'd like to ask you in particular about the middle town of Smithborough, because I mean, for for a small board, the village and the area in particular, I mean, this could be a real game changer. Yeah. And you know the thing, the way I, the way I say it, I mean, it's not only providing the link between Monaghan and Armagh or connecting communities on sustainable travel. There's, there will be opportunities with it. And I'm just wondering, in that respect, um, where are we in terms of the time frame? And we are we on, and are we on the on the road to delivering that project? Okay, uh, well, the middle of Smith, buddy, yeah. yeah, no, Joe, Joe Gillespie is is on the advisory group, so I'm going to pass your question to Joe if that's okay, and let him deal with that. Um, the Ulster Canal Greenway project uh, is led by Waterways Ireland and uh, we do have Armagh in there and Monaghan County Council and our project manager based in Monaghan in the council. Um, I'm happy to report that the section north of the border to Middletown has just has gone to planning in the month of March, as has the section from Monaghan Town out to the border. So those are now sitting in planning for consideration by the planners and there's been much consultation with the planners ahead of that submission. So we'll be hopeful that those will go through smoothly. Um, yes, it will be a game changer for those communities. We would hope that they would be well used. We have made an application for additional funding to, to SEUPP to make sure that we can deliver all that we said we would deliver. Um, and that is still with SEUPP for consideration. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a model of uh, collaboration across the border in terms of development of the Greenway product and bringing an awareness of the waterway, of the heritage that lies within that community as well. By having the Greenway there, I think it will protect the Ulster Canal uh, for future generations. No, I, absolutely. And, and I mean, it, well, it's, it's not, I'm, I'm my part of the constituency is there, and it's bored in Monaghan. I know Clonus fairly well myself, and, and I've been down there, and I've, I've travelled over late and seen some of the waterways. But in, in the absence of, of, of the... The Ulster Canal way moving forward, obviously up to the lakes of, say, towards the Charlemont or the Mire or up towards Ben Borb, in terms of bringing the Greenway forward, is there an opportunity to do that? And have you looked at the lakes of, um, we talked about funding earlier on, there's a large cycling budget in the south. Have you tapped into that there to try and encourage any of that there to try and promote some of those projects, especially in, in terms of for, for ourselves? to try and move further north for Middletown in the future? As part of the work we've done on the Ulster Canal Greenway, we have devised a strategy which has identified 12 routes either along the Ulster Canal or running off from the Ulster Canal. And uh, it will be for various partners to, to seek out the funding. So a number of feasibility studies have been done on various sections, okay? And it will be the job of the advisory group and the individual councils to seek funding. So for instance, Monaghan is looking at the section that runs from Smithborough West towards Clonus. Mm -hmm. So they've done a feasibility study there. They got funding for that, did that. Now they're moving into the environmental phase. They're looking at the studies to do with the, you know, the ecology and that sort of thing. They've got funding through the Carbon Tax Fund in the South. Cavan County Council have looked at the route between Cavan reaching up towards Castle Saunderson and the Ulster Canal, again funded through the Carbon Tax Fund and reaching over to Belturbet. So there are, as you say, there are a number of sources of funding in the south. Yeah, they're directly for, from a Greenway fund, from a shared island fund, from rural regeneration development fund, or outdoor recreation. So we're not short of opportunities, and it's, as you say, it's, it's, the time is right to, to push forward with uh, as many of these projects as we can in partnership with the councils. No, absolutely, and, and listen, I've enjoyed the presentation. Just one final point, because... I think we, we can learn from COVID and, and take it forward in terms of, I mentioned tourism, but, and, and John, you've explained that, that it's, it's not only tourism, but there's opportunities here. And I mean, um, mental health and all of those things associated with these things, these things have created major opportunities for us. I'm just wondering, just because uh, I enjoyed, I was looking at Slade 25, because I can see it moving further north. Um, see in terms of the Ulster Canal restoration, there's three phases there. I mean, when do you foresee those phases finished? And also, um, have you any indication what your next steps are going to be? Or maybe it was a bit early to ask that, but just, just where are you in relation to that there? 
Yeah, I, I'm going to just defer that one to Joe McMahon because he's the closest to it. So, uh, Joe, if you could pick that one up. Uh, John, uh, I suppose we have talked about phase one complete. Phase two, we're now focusing on in, in Clonus, which is uh, a kilometre stretch of, of canal from the canal stores in Clonus uh, out, out to the border at, at Clonfad. And um, uh, subject to obviously securing the balance of the infrastructure costs, we are hoping to deliver that uh, section uh, by uh, mid late 2023, all things being equal. Um, and then, in terms of the phase three piece that we've already talked about between Castle Saunderson and uh, Clonfad, I suppose we, we have said there that, that there has been a, a, a sum of money secured through the shared island to, to look at bringing forward various studies in order to, to develop some of the sub phases within that. And I suppose we continue to talk to the the shared island uh, people in terms of potential future funding. So there are a number of discussions ongoing around funding for infrastructure in, in terms of the phase three piece. Um, there are, I suppose, in terms of, of discussing sub phases, there, there, there is one section uh, within that phase three piece that is uh, within, uh, totally within Ireland and, and will require a uh, a new planning permission because it will be timed out in 2023. So we have proposals this year to um, do the necessary work or commence the necessary work around that piece and get it back into planning um, late 2022, probably early 2023. But there are uh, significant sections of phase three which are in Northern Ireland and which have planning permission in place. And uh, if we were successful with securing funding for those, we, we get on with, uh, I suppose, the, the works then to, to deliver the infrastructure itself. Well, no, thank you very much for the for the presentation. And like I say, they're wonderful assets. And maybe, maybe you someday those Fermanagh people will be able to travel up the canal, up to Clonus, up to the Ulster Fine or something, if we hurry up and get that done. You know what I mean? But listen, thank you very much for your presentation, OK? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Kelly. Kelly. We don't seem to have her at the moment. I'll move on to uh, Mr. Muir and then come back to Mrs. Kelly. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, all my questions have been asked and answered by Cal. Uh, well, they were asked by Cal and you yourselves quite kindly answered them um, because I think the Ulster Canal uh, will have a major benefit to the economy and to tourism and as someone who likes going down to that area um haven't been there for over a year now um it would be really good to see that and i think even if you're watching recent documentaries um as around uh, enda in terms of greenways you're seeing the, the economic impact of that so i think you're doing a significant amount of work around this i know it's challenging because you know trying to get landholder permissions and all the rest of it can be really really difficult um, so I commend you for the work in relation to that. And it, it, I probably you probably want to move things at a faster pace than what you want to, but you need to do it right. You need to bring people with you, and that's the most important thing is to bring people with you in relation to these things. So I think it's important that we we get this achieved. And uh, if it's ever um, completed, uh, then myself and Carl can hopefully cycle the whole distance of it. So that's the challenge, GV Carl. <laughs> <laughs> So no question. That's fine. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll go back to see if Mrs. Kelly is available. No. I just have a, a blank screen here, although she's still online. Okay. Um, we maybe just move to conclusion. Can I just thank you, um, the three of you, actually, for your very comprehensive briefing this morning and, and taking questions and, and answering them so fully. Um, as I said in the introduction, I suppose it is a shame that we haven't had an opportunity to engage before this um, and certainly would look forward to, to meeting in person as and when it's permitted to do so. 
Um, so can I, can I thank you for that this morning uh, and hopefully we'll see you again soon. Okay, well, let me, on behalf of Waterways Ireland, thank you um, and your members. Uh, you are always welcome to come and visit us in Enskillen when time allows. So that's an open invitation. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, okay. we'll leave the call now. Thank you. Okay, members, um, obviously due to, we, we ran over quite considerably uh, on that briefing and um, it was difficult to anticipate when um, it would conclude. So um, we've taken the decision that um, the next briefing will be um, provided to us via a riff of written briefing and we will look to reschedule um, and speak again to um, Derek McCallum from Nilga and also um, representation from Sola. So we do send our apologies um, to Derek, Lisa and John um, for that. It is, it is quite difficult um, to be able to manage um, the meeting um, sort, of, sort of in this, in this hybrid um, sort of situation because obviously members aren't maybe just as aware of the time that we have here. Um, so I think we maybe just have to bear that in mind for future meetings. Um, as to, to where we are and the length of time that we, we allow. But I think that meeting, that briefing from Waterways Ireland was, um, was incredibly useful um, for members. Um, and I think that we did get quite a lot out of that. So um, if we're happy to move on then to the forward work programme at item 14, just draw your attention to that at page 416. Members are content to note. Chair, Chair, uh, Mr. Foster. Muir. Yeah, first of all, thank you for sharing this meeting. Uh, it, it must be extremely difficult with everyone, well, not everyone, but most people remotely. Um, so I do agree with your comment around that. I'm just conscious of um, two, two things. Um, obviously, the executive meet tomorrow in relation to the relaxation of the restrictions. And what seems likely to be on the horizon is the resumption of um, driving tests, um, but obviously the committee's had a lot of um, issues and concerns around that and the severe backlog. And I just don't know whether as part of the forward work program or as part of correspondence that we seek to engage with officials to see well, what, how they're going to manage this, because I know that a number of people have got concerns that if the restrictions are relaxed, you know, it's still going to be quite a long period of time before they're able to get those driving tests and they need to be able to get those so they can undertake their work. Uh, and the other sort of separate but related thing is that obviously as of Monday, the stay at home order um, uh, was removed and obviously the guidance is now stay local, but we're obviously seeing more people out and about. And over the next weeks and months, we're gonna see more people traveling. Um, and it's just whether we should be engaging with TransLink uh, as part of the forward work program to understand their restart plans in terms of people getting um, you know, more, more mobility within society. Okay, thank you. Um, and certainly that we would like to include TransLink and, and Jeremy Logan in the forward programme. Although, um, um, Andrew, you'll be aware that the Minister is coming to brief us on uh, the stay week. So there'll be an opportunity, obviously, dependent upon the information that comes out in the announcement that comes out tomorrow um, and any dates associated with that, that we can actually have the conversation with her in advance of DVA coming to, to brief us. Yeah, I think yeah, I think that would be useful. I think just the issue is, is that obviously hopefully there'll be an announcement tomorrow from the executive about the restart of driving lessons and tests. But what we need from DVA is, you know, complete clarity about how they're going to restart these tests. Um, because I think there's a risk of a lot of confusion uh, around, you know, who's going to be prioritised and the rest. So maybe that's a matter for correspondence today. Yep, OK. I, but I've also had... Uh, someone speak in my ear to tell me that Jeremy Logan will be briefing the committee as well next Wednesday. So while we can um, write today, um, we can actually get that information at first hand next week. Yeah, so thank you. I'm, I'm kind of hearing things in both ears. <laughs> okay, um, anyone else in relation to Forward Work Programme? Okay, no, thank you. So any other business? Maybe cover a little Just bit of that. Just something you need ready for a second challenge down those kind of green ways, sorry. <laughs> okay. yeah, challenge accepted then, Carl. Okay, I think that might be a private conversation. <laughs> um, the date and time of the next meeting, it's next, next week at 10am in the Senate Chamber. 
And as I've said, we're getting an update on the budget, and the minister will also be in attendance to provide a briefing of, on um, sort of current issues. Um, so, if members are content, we'll adjourn the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Janet Chamber, programme signed.